have your Bible open to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. We'll begin reading in just a moment with verse 14. 1 Kings, chapter 19, verse 14. And the Bible says, and he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because of the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I even, I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholoth, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Verse 18 of 1 Kings chapter 19. Yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel. All the knees which have not bowed unto Baal and every mouth which hath not kissed him. I want you to take the time to mark that expression given by God. 7,000 who never bowed the knee to the false god Baal. And their mouths have never kissed his feet. 7,000. I want to know more about that 7,000. How about you? I want to know more about the people in the midst of the crisis that has arisen in our reading who have never been anything but true to God. Some, as in our time, may be young people. Some young adult people. But none pretentious no one pretending to be something they're not. 7,000 who are true to God. That means 7,000 whose prayers God hear. 7,000 who love the word of God and are true to the word of God. 7,000 in the most difficult time in the history of their land when their king is living a godless life being true to the Lord. 7,000. Just as God would look at your life and my life and say, I know him. I truly know him. I know her. I know she's a genuine woman or he is a genuine man. I know that he loves the Lord. I know she loves the Lord and I've counted them. And God says, in my recollection, there are 7,000. Now, some people would like to say that this is some exaggeration or some number just thrown out. But I believe 
as God numbers the hairs of your head and my head and knows everything about your life and my life. He knew 7,000 people living under the reign of the most wicked king that ever lived, still true to God. Now think about it. And I'm going to tell you, I want to know more about those 7,000. There are times in life when we need encouragement. There are times in life that we really need real encouragement. And there are people who are sensitive to that, who know the Lord, who love the Lord. They don't just pretend to be something they're not. They're genuine. They're part of the 7,000. Now, I first wanted to race through this passage of Scripture. In 1 Kings chapter 16, and 1 Kings chapter 17, 1 Kings chapter 18, and then 1 Kings chapter 19. But I determined by God's grace, as I've read and prayed, sought the mind of the Lord. I'm praying sincerely for revival. Where will revival come? What people can God touch and put his hand on and use them for the Lord? Who are they? Who are they? In the private secret place of their life, who are they? God looks at them, listens to them pray, walks with them. They're the genuine article. And God is pleased. You believe there's a real God? Just as surely as believing that there's a real heaven and a real earth? a real heaven and a real hell, then there are people who separate themselves to the Lord who live unlike the rest of the world who are professing Christians. Elijah came to the place, mighty Elijah, a miracle-working man, a mighty man, when I read some of his exploits in a moment, you're going to think, how could one man do such a thing? God knew. But he got so low, so discouraged, that he said, God, I'm the only one still standing. I'm the only one I know without a pretense who's genuine. I, even I, alone, and the only man. And God said, oh no. There's 7,000 you don't know. You don't know their names. You don't know where they live. You don't know what they go through. But there are people that I bless and I honor who are in tune with me, the Lord says. 7,000, and I can tell you, there's 7,000 of them who have never turned to a false god like everybody else. There's 7,000 of them who have never worshipped or pretended to worship that false god. And I say there's time in life for us to get better acquainted with the 7,000. Say, Lord... Speak to us because we get the idea sometimes, especially if you listen to some people, that everybody's doing whatever they shouldn't be doing. Everyone is engaged in what they should not be engaged in. Everyone is living in pretense. God says, no, 7,000. 
Right, right here in his word. Look at it, please. He says, and he numbers them. In verse 18 of chapter 19. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel. And concerning this 7,000, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal and every mouth of the 7,000 has not kissed his idol. God, tell me more, please. Encourage my heart, please. Let me know the 7,000. One day I came into the hallways of the auditorium and I stepped into a men's restroom to take care of some private matters. And a little boy, no more than eight years old, said, Pastor, where have you been? And I said, what do you mean? I was here last Sunday. Well, you weren't. And how's your wife? I was here, and she wasn't here. And I thought, he knew enough about me, cared enough about me and what I was doing. No, I wasn't in my place. And he said, I'm praying for you. And I wonder how many people are like that. People we don't know. People we don't think about. People whose names we don't call. But they're part of God's 7,000. My wife went somewhere to get something done with a car. She's always involved in that kind of thing. And the man who worked on it said, how's the pastor? He knew it was my car. And he said, I pray for him. I pray for him. I couldn't recognize him in a crowd, I can't call his name, but he knew my wife and said to my wife, tell your husband I'm praying for him. I hear that all the time. And they're part of the 7,000 that we don't know. We have to stop sometimes and remind ourselves that God has a people on earth. They, they may, not, may not be doing everything you expect them to do or I expect them to do but they know God and they're praying for God's work and they're following the Lord all the time Evelyn says to me do you know how many people are praying for you do you know how many young boys and girls are praying for you and you know those are the kind of people you never have to give them attention they don't demand it. They're just straight up with God. They're part of the 7,000. I want to ask you this question. Do you want to be one of those 7,000? Do you want to be one of those people? God had them. Let's take just a moment. I was taking a little shorter time. But I want you to look, please. Write this down at the history of the prophet Elijah. What God has to said about him. If you read the 16th chapter of 1 Kings, you'll come to the 28th verse and the Bible says, so Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria. And Ahab, his son, reigned in his stead. And in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. 
verse 30, chapter 16. And Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Now, when God makes a statement like that, pay attention to it. God says, I know every king that reigned. I know all their ins and outs. I know every decision they made. And I'm saying to you, this is the worst one that ever reigned. And it came to pass, verse 31, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took a wife, took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshiped him. Now, this is the king that's over God's people. And the Bible says he took the most wicked woman, the most wicked woman, and took her God as his God and worshiped him. And the Bible says in verse 32, and he reared up an altar for Baal, in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And verse 33 says, and Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Now there you have God's describing the leader. Now some people say, well, hey, we got problems in the White House. We got problems with the office of the president of the United States. We don't have anything like this. There never lived a more wicked man to reign than Ahab. That's what God says in preparation for this. Look what he tells us. We come to the 17th chapter, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. That's calamity. God sent his prophet Elijah to the presence of the king. He knew where to find him. And he walked into the court of the king. I don't know who was there. Some, of course, and he made an announcement. I want you to know, we live by the water God gives us from heaven. He created this land that we live in that depends on the water God put in the rivers and the water he gives in the rain. We can't have a crop. We can't feed our animals. People can't live if we don't have water. And Ahab's listening. But Elijah said, I want you to know something. God's told me there's not going to be any rain, any rain these years, but according to my word. And when you get to the second verse of the 17th chapter, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. God said, Go show yourself to Ahab, and tell him that I'm drying up the rain. And when you make that announcement, They're going to laugh at you. They're going to think about the last time it rained. Well, they've gathered rain. But the rainy season will come and there'll be no rain. The places where they gathered water will be there, but they will gather no water. And then suddenly but surely, animals will start dying people will start dying. The land will be baked by the sun and all the rain that God usually gives his people 
is going to dry up. And I want you to do something. I want you to go to the brook Cherith. And he explains to him that there's a widow woman who's got a son and she's going to take care of you. She's got a barrel she's been using. Look at verse 12 of chapter 17. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and for my son that we may eat it and look, please, and die. It's over for us. We're going to eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me. And after, make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste Neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Just trust the Lord. Do what I've come to ask you to do. God will take care of you. If you take care of his work and his workers, God's going to take care of you. And to beat it all, the Bible says in the 17th verse, and her son, the only one she had to love, fell sick. That's the way the Bible says it, verse 17. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. Now, they're already dying of thirst. They've got no water. They had one handful of meal in a barrel. She's given to the prophet to make a cake for him. And verse 20 says, And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come in, into him again. And the Bible says in verse 22, and the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Come down to verse 24. And the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that thou art a man of God and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. So what's God doing with Elijah? You think what's God going to do with the hunt country? Before God can work in our country, he must prepare a people to whom and through whom he can work through. Are you going to be one of them? When God's out looking for people, who's he looking for? The mouthy people who get all the attention or the 7,000 who've never bowed a knee to a heathen God? What's he doing? What's he doing? I want to look more at that 7,000. What's he doing for the prophet what is the prophet getting from this? God's sustaining him. But God's proving something to him. And he's proving something not only to the prophet, he's proving to the people with whom the prophet works that the prophet is a man of God. Now the Lord says, look please, as he works with the brook of Cherith 
and the widow woman and the boy who fell sick. All this time, the country's drying up. If you haven't looked rightly, if you haven't thought about the shape America's in, I'd like to to give you a message of hope about it, but I have nothing hopeful to say about three million families who have removed their children from the public school system. And the national education heads said, we're gonna to continue to cram every idolatrous, evil thing into the minds of your children. And church leaders just happens to be the Methodist, the United Methodist, it could have been the Baptist, said we've got to make room for the homosexual crowd in our churches. And I wonder, what does God do when we see all this? I first had a long list of things that are documented that I thought I'd bring, just read them to you. That's shocking, shocking but I just wanted you to know, no matter what's going on, God is looking for the 7,000 who've never bowed a knee, who've never worshiped an idol. And you know what's the problem in a church like this church? Many of you are living on the reputation of this church and not on your own faith. A name, oh yes. But it's not what you believe. It's what you identify with in your heart. God knows. It's not you. You have to make up your mind. Are you gonna be one of the 7,000? Or one of those who disobeys the Lord. And I understand most pastors don't preach like I preach. God bless them. They may do better than I'm doing. But I'm talking to you about whether or not you were one of the 7,000. I want you to notice, please, we come to the 18th chapter. And the Bible says, and it came to pass that after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show thyself unto Ahab. First he said to Elijah, go make the announcement in the court of the king, tell him it's not gonna rain, and then go hide yourself. Because they're gonna search the land out to try to kill you. They're gonna find everyone who wants to put you to death. Then God took the prophet Elijah and he worked in his life to strengthen his faith. And now God says, it's time for you to go show yourself. I'd mark that little word, show thyself. Go show thyself in verse one. Because many people, many people are trying to show themselves who have never hidden themselves with God. There's a rough life and a war against God going on. When finally Ahab, the king, by the way, the most wicked king that had ever lived, came face to face with Ahab and Elijah. The Bible says in chapter 18 in verse 17, and it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, he's infuriated. He hates him. He despises him. That Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Mark that, would you? In other words, you're, you're the problem. You Bible thumpers, you people who believe the true and living God, you you people who want people to pray and trust the Lord. Can't you be like everybody else? Accepting everything from everybody else? You have to be a troublemaker. 
We'd all get along fine if it wasn't for you. So Ahab says to Elijah, aren't you the trouble here? You don't let us do what we want to do, say what we want to say. I was speaking to a man the other day who asked me, and some of you men were standing not too far from me, about our political leaders in the city of Knoxville, not the county, but the city. We have a government that has a city council and a city government. And I said, they're trying to make, the city government is trying to make Knoxville, Tennessee, the San Francisco of the South. And they have an agenda to do it. And the things they're doing, I was telling the man, and the things they're doing are an abomination to God. You know what he did? He was on our property. You know what he did? He turned around and left. And I'm sure he left saying, you know, that Pastor Sexton is the kind of problem people we've got to deal with. So in the day of Elijah, Ahab said, now it's you. We've been looking everywhere for you. You're the idiot who walked in and said, it's not gonna rain. God's gonna deal with our land. It was a laughing matter. The people are dying everywhere. People are starving. You're the person who's troubling Israel. Now I want you to sit up and listen. There are people who don't have enough spiritual sense, and some of them are in this audience, who don't have enough spiritual sense to understand if you rebel against God and pretend to be something you're not, that God is a personal God and God will deal with you about that. Lord, help us. And I love you and I want God's blessing on your life and I want God's blessing on our church. But who are the people troubling? And the prophet, by the way, he had to be prepared for this. He was not strong enough for this before God prepared him. The prophet answered. He answered, verse 18, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and has not allowed, not followed Balaam. has followed Balaam. The prophet turned around and said, no, I'm not the problem. You're the problem, king. And he challenged the king to have a showdown on Mount Carmel. I wish I had the time just to read it all to you. I hope you'll read it from your Bible. Verse 42 of the same chapter. So Ahab sent up, went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. Read his prayer. Before you see the prayer of the fire being called from heaven, here, the prophet prays for God to work and said to the, his steward, his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. Now he's already been to Mount Carmel and he's seen the Lord work in a mighty way. And he's gotten so discouraged even though God gave him the victory and the fire fell, I want you to see the fire falling. When the fire fell, you wouldn't imagine this. When God answered by fire and the Lord blessed, the prophet got discouraged. 
and he wanted to die. That's what's behind what the Lord said in the 18th verse of the 19th chapter. I want to talk to you about what he said to the prophet. Go sleep, rest, eat, get more sleep, rest, eat, get more sleep. And while you're talking about what kind of shape your country's in, what kind of shape you're in, and how you're praying to die and don't want to live, I want to tell you something. I have 7,000 in this land who have not bowed a knee. 7,000 who are seeking the Lord, doing the right thing. And I want you to know that when I get discouraged, and I do, and when I want to say it's not worth it, and I do. When I say I've poured my life and soul, I have not another life to give, and I do. And I want to say, some of you don't even care enough to ever darken the door on Sunday night a prayer meeting. It means nothing to you. And it's true. God says to me, don't give up. Don't give up. There's 7,000 who haven't bowed a knee, who haven't kissed the feet of idols, who love the Lord. I'm not saying to you, you be one of those 7,000. I'm saying to you, take a good look at where you stand and what the Lord means to you because we're living in the most perilous times that I can imagine as I look back across my life, ever living when the nation is actually imploding. I don't even like to say it. I see it imploding. And the profane things that people are publicly doing will turn your stomach. The percentage of people given to these things and accepting these things. And you wonder, can it ever come back? Can revival ever come? I just want to say, Lord, I believe that there's people you know about who truly love you, who need to stand up, who are part of the 7,000, who want to do the right thing. Help us to be hopeful and look to you and find those 7,000. I know this is much of a sermon but it's an appeal. It's an appeal to your heart before the fire of God falls, before the trouble comes in waves that you ever, never imagined could happen in the land of the free and the home of the brave. And wicked King Ahab, who was so wicked, so wicked, was not the answer, getting him straightened out. It wasn't the answer. God's people were showing up, praying, 
believe in the Lord. God sent a fire from heaven, a mighty spirit of God fell. And the Lord moved. I just want to encourage you. There are 7,000 praying, believing, trusting the Lord. God, open my eyes and open your eyes. Be one of them and to see they're there. Trust the Lord. Let's pray together.